Good morning, Renewal, friends and family and brothers and sisters. It is a joy to be worshiping with you this morning. And before we begin our time to worship, uh, let's just take a few seconds and to consider that what we're about to do, worshiping our Lord, that is what you were created to do. And not only us, but as we will read in Psalm 148, all of creation, that our purpose, that our desire is to worship God. And when we do, that is when we feel most at home. So with that in mind, let us now recite the call to worship. I will read the first part and church repeat after me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, Beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. Join me as we pray together that God will be honored and glorified through our time of worship. God in heaven, Lord, that is what we want to do. We want you to be magnified. We want you to be at the center of our worship and our lives. And God, we confess every day we drift bit by bit away from you as we think about ourselves, as we're occupied with the things of this world. And God, we don't just put them aside, but we pray that you be at the center of all of these things as you're at the center of our lives. So be magnified, be glorified, be praised. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us magnify our Lord.
what the future brings. I will watch and wait for the Savior King. Then my joy complete, standing face to face in the presence of the God, he is the ancient of days, almighty and powerful. And when we think about who he is, let us now take time to think about who we are. We are sinners deserving of his wrath because of the sins that we have committed against him. And we do that every week. As we focus on God, we repent and we confess our sins together. And to help us to do that this morning, we'll be reading what Jesus Christ says to the second church in the book of Revelation. We've been going through the various churches, and this morning we'll be listening to his words to the church of Smyrna. And I will read that for us, and let us repent together. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and they're not, but they are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let us pray this prayer together that confesses our, our, our tendency to cling on to ourselves and not Christ. Let us pray. Blessed Father, have mercy on us. Our fickle faith becomes exposed when trials come to dethrone our worldly hopes, interests, and concerns. We resist your urging to weaken our attachment to things unclean, from predominance of evil passions, from the sugar of sin, as well as its gall. We ignore your call to hold life loosely in our hands. We forget that true life is received only on condition of its surrender. Loving Father, if you have appointed storms of tribulation, you will be with us in them. If we have to pass through tempests of persecution and temptation, we shall not drown. If we are to die, we shall see your face the sooner. Grant us grace that our faith fail not. We make no other stipulation, but only glorify yourself in us, whether in comfort or trial, as chosen vessels meet always for your use. We trust, we hope, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let us now take a few minutes and personally confess our sins to the Lord. Perhaps there have been tribulations and suffering coming your way, but in those moments, have you been clinging on to Christ and turning to him? If not, let us confess.
brothers and sisters, when tribulation comes your way, may the first thing that you do is to cling on to Christ, to not be ashamed of the gospel, but to know that he will provide a way through it and he will be with you. Hear this assurance. Paul writes this, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, the one who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, the one who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. With that assurance in our hearts, let us confess what we believe by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With that in our hearts, let us continue to worship him as forgiven people and praise him through this song.
of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus, he conquered the grave. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Lord God, you are mighty, you are powerful, yet in that power, you are merciful and gracious to us. We thank you for that. We pray that we wouldn't take the grace that you give to us daily, every moment for granted, and that we live grateful, we live empowered, we live lives that are uh, for you, God, in response to that grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue to worship, let us do that through our prayers. And first, let's do that by praying for our country, for our neighborhoods, and for our local areas as well. And then afterwards, we'll be praying for the nations. We'll be praying for the country of Russia. So first, let us take a few seconds. Let us pray for our nation. Let us pray for those who are working in health care, for those who are working in schools and government officials, that they may be safe and protected, and that they may be able to help our country to be safe and flourish. Let's also pray for our leaders, our president and his wife, as they are overcoming their sickness as well, uh, knowing that the word, our Bible, calls us to pray for our leaders, for their well-being, so that they can lead us well. So let us pray for them. Let's also pray for our local teachers and our officials as well, that as they continue to serve our people, to serve us, that they may be strengthened and they may be able to do that well uh, for God as well. So let us do that for a few seconds and then we'll pray for the country of Russia. Our sister Esther will be leading our time as we pray for Russia. Today we will be praying for the country of Russia. Though life has been better after the chaotic years of the early 90s, freedoms are stifled, the business climate is difficult, and millions still struggle against poverty and ill health. A whole wasted educated generation is opting out of political and civic participation. The Russian Orthodox Church, the ROC, survived communism and remains the major symbol of Russian identity. Along with smaller Christian groups, it endured terrible persecution between 1920 and 1990, when up to 200,000 leaders died as martyrs, as well as even more parishioners. Yet we praise God for the decline of atheism and the entrance of new gospel initiatives and churches after the fall of the Iron Curtain. Evangelicals have tripled in number since 1991 to about 1.2% of the population and are making a place for themselves within Russian religious culture. As you pray, please praise God and ask for further Russian renewal and renaissance centered around a faith in Christ. Pray that the churches will not see one another as a threat, but work together to promote Christ in the country. Pray that their deep history of tradition or preconceived notions of Christianity will not prevent them from seeing and accepting the grace of salvation. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you, Lord, for Russia and for the ways you are helping them survive a chaotic time in history. We thank you for a people rich in culture and strength. We want to lift them up to you that you might continue to protect their freedoms and grow this current generation of educated Russians to care about moving their society forward and growing faithful believers. We know that there were so many sacrifices of the martyred Christians to create a place for the church and the gospel work that is happening. We pray that the deep-seated history of tradition and preconceived notions of Christianity would not hinder the Russians from seeing and accepting the grace of Christ and his salvation. We pray that the Christians would band together and be supportive to be a part of the gospel spreading movement rather than seeing each other as a threat. 
Would you raise up a generation that will be movers and shakers in Russian government and society? We lift Russia and its people up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 My name is Luke Wu. I am one of the pastors here at our church. And now I want to highlight some announcements for us. And first, I just want to welcome anyone who is tuning in with us this morning. And if you are new, uh, we're glad that we can worship together. And now I know that uh, these past few months that we've been um, pretty distant and isolated from one another, and we don't know who we're worshiping with. Uh, but one of the ways that we can uh, help mitigate that is by connecting with one another. So even if this is your first time uh, joining us, I want to ask you to fill out this small form on our website, renewalmainline.org backslash new. And if you do so, we want to connect with you, how we can pray for you, pray with you, and how we can do life together as we worship him as a church. So please, if you are new, fill out this form. We can tell you more about our children's ministry, our youth group ministry as well, and our college ministries that are still going on uh, throughout this pandemic season. So please fill that out. Next, I want to highlight our congregational prayer meeting. Now, every month, we as a church, we gather together and we, to, and we pray, uh, not only for our church, uh, but for our neighborhoods, our country, and the world. And I know that there are many things that we see in the news today. And if you're like me, my initial reaction is trying to think of ways to solve things, trying to think of ways to fix problems. Uh, but we know uh, that God calls us to pray and not to pray uh, and, and disregard everything else we're supposed to do, but to praise that through all that we do, that God is the one working in us. So if that is you, join us as we pray for so many things that need prayer. This Wednesday at 8 o'clock, if you go to our homepage, the link uh, to join our Zoom room will be there. Next, I want to uh, give instructions on how we can participate in Missions Month in the month of November. Now, every November, we want to focus on this area of global missions. And one way we do that is we commit to pray uh, for the nations all around the world every day for a different uh, need, for a different country. And so if you want to commit and join us in praying every day uh, with your roommates and your family, fill out this form. And then we will send you a physical prayer guide and a prayer calendar so you can hang that up on your refrigerator, uh, put that in your Bible, and you can pray with us every day. You can also fill out the form to request med packs. And what they are is uh, we send you these blank, uh, empty plastic bags, and there's instructions of how you can fill that bag, and then you can send that and ship that uh, to various persecuted Christians around the world so that they can use that uh, for their relief. So all of that can be filled out by going to renewalmainline.org backslash missions, and it is due by October 18th. Next, reconciled and reconciling. Now, our sister church at West Philly will be having their city conference, and we'll be joining them on October 23rd and 24th on Friday night and Saturday afternoon. And it's going to be a time where we're going to be learning uh, just what it looks like to be a reconciled and reconciling community here at Renewal. And we're going to have Reverend Erwin Wince, uh, a, a well-loved pastor uh, within our community. He's also the director of Grace DC Institute for Cross-Cultural Mission. And so details on how to participate uh, is to come, but please mark that on your calendars. It will be virtual, and we'll be having discussion uh, with our brothers and sisters after his uh, seminars as well. And finally, please look at our upcoming events and mark those days as we give more information in the few weeks to come, uh, and mark that on your calendars. Finally, if you are in any need, whether it be spiritual, emotional, or financial, uh, please do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, we have brothers and sisters willing and wanting to help any of those who are in need. So email that email address there. And finally, let's take a few seconds. And if you are new, please do not feel obligated to give. Uh, but if you have been with us, you can give through our website under resources or mail checks to us at that address. And let's just take a few seconds and thank the Lord and say, God, this is my offering to you. And as we do so, let's also turn to our scripture. Take out your Bibles.
Our passage for this morning, uh, morning comes from Jonah chapter 1, verses 17 through chapter 2, verse 10. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the root of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Good morning. My name is Bill Smith. I'm one of the pastors here at Renewal Mainline. This morning when I woke up, I did what I normally do, which I think many of you do. I reached for my phone, picked it up. I I check to see what happened in the world overnight, uh, check email. And there on my email, I had a message from a number of you. It was for Pastor Appreciation Month, and there was this video. So I didn't spend a lot of time this morning on news and world. Instead, I had you speaking to me, and, and I have to be honest, I, I, I got very teary uh, a number of times. I miss seeing you, I, I miss being able to interact um, face to face, but I just want to say thank you so much uh, for doing that. friend asked me not too long ago, he said, okay, now that the honeymoon period is over, we've, my wife and I have been here a little bit over a year, honeymoon period is over, but he said, now that the honeymoon period is over, what do you think of renewal? I said the exact same thing that I've been telling everybody. We could not be happier. We are so blessed, feel very um, thankful that God has, through you, invited us to be part of this community and uh, that we've been able to share our lives with you, that you've been able to share your lives with us, that you've been in our home, we've been in yours before COVID. But even after that, we're able to connect on Zoom and to continue to live out this life of faith together. Uh, So I wanted to say thank you, and on behalf of Pastor David, Pastor Luke, and myself, this is a wonderful community. Thank you very much for the privilege of serving you. We are continuing our teaching series this morning in the book of Jonah. It's a book all about the nature of God's radical grace to people who don't deserve it, people like you, people like me, and it's all about the many different ways that this radical grace is extended to us by God. Now, we've come to a shift in today's book. For the very first time, Jonah, the prophet of the Lord, for the very first time, he actually talks to God. Keep in mind the context here from chapter 1. He's rejected the word of the Lord to love his enemies. He's fled from the Lord's presence. And because he's hardened his heart against God, he no longer cares about anything that happens in the world around him. He's put himself into a very deep spiritual sleep. And so he is completely unaware of the real needs of people around him. And the result of that spiritual sleepiness is judgment, the judgment of God that's broken into his life. And so the question as we enter into chapter two is just how radical is God's grace? We've already seen that God warns people of his coming judgment. He did that with the sailors. He wants to do that with the city of Nineveh. That's amazing that God would want to warn people that have wanted nothing to do with him is astounding. But is that the extent of this grace or Or does it go even further? What happens if, like Jonah, you know about judgment, but you blow God off? Is there hope for you anyway? What do you do when you've fallen asleep inside? What do you do when the things of God are not interesting to you, when when you have no taste for them? What do you do when you've already started to experience some of the judgment of God? When you're depressed? when you're dragging yourself through life, when you have no joy, 
When you know that you should care about God, when you know that you should care about what he thinks, but you don't. You know that you should move toward him, but you don't. The question, is there any hope for you in that place? And let's be honest with each other for a moment this morning. Everyone who's ever followed Christ knows where that place is, and they know what it feels like to be there. Is there any hope when you're there? And that's not a hypothetical question for many of you. I've talked with a number of you recently. We've talked and, and you've shared that that is where you are. Is there any hope for you when you feel like that? And if so, what does that hope look like and how do you take advantage of it? That's what today's passage is all about. Now we're gonna look at several different principles today. We're gonna to look at different things that you can do. But before we get there, I wanna say something up front because I wanna make sure that you don't lose sight of the most important thing here. We're not studying abstract principles and activities that have their own independent autonomous existence. In other words, we're not, we're not studying a vending machine. You know how vending machines work. You come up to it, you put your money in, you swipe your card, you push the button and you get out what you want. It's very mechanical, mechanistic. We're not studying things like that this morning. We're studying things that are part of a relationship part of a very complex relationship between God and his people. So you can't look at these things today as mechanical truisms, things that you need to believe, things that you need to do, and then you'll get an automatic result out of them. Instead, you have to look at them as extensions of who God is, extensions of how God treats people. And if you'll look at him that way, suddenly you'll discover you have much greater confidence in him because he's giving you reasons to have confidence in him especially reasons to trust him when you've been going the wrong way. See, you look at somebody like Jonah and you watch how God treats Jonah, someone who has rejected God, who has boldly said, I know what God wants and I don't care. I want something else. Look at how God treats him and then allow yourself to start thinking, if God can handle someone like Jonah, then maybe, just, just maybe, he can handle someone like me too. Learn from Jonah today, learn what's true, learn what you need to do, but learn it in the context of a personal interaction with a personal God who's showing you what he's like, who's showing you how he'll treat you even when you mistreat him. So with that in mind, what do you do when you've put yourself to sleep? Three things this morning. First, look for God's hand in your life. Second, Turn back to this God who saves you. And then third, you have to respond to the salvation that God gives. Look for God's hand in your life. Turn back to God and then respond to his salvation. So first, look for God's hand in your life. Read back through chapter two. And you learn not only that God is very involved in Jonah's life, but that Jonah is aware of it. He sees it. Verse three, he says to God, you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. You cast me. Even though the sailors were the ones who picked him up and threw him over the gunwale of the ship, Jonah says to God, you cast me. God is not passive in running his world. He executes his plans, he executes his desires, but he often uses secondary means to do that. And Jonah knows it. He sees it with his own eyes. God operates through the sailors. God also operates through the sea. You continue in verse three, Jonah says to God, all your waves and your billows passed over me. In other words, the waves and the billows are not part of an impersonal natural world, natural world order. They belong to God and they operate according to what God tells them to do. As does the great fish that God appointed in chapter one, verse 17, to swallow up Jonah. And again, Jonah's aware of this. Chapter two, verse six, he says, yet you, God, brought up my life from the pit. Jonah had been down at the bottom of the sea, verse six, at the roots of the mountains, but God brought him up. How did God do that? He directed a great fish to swallow him at that place. Now, if you think about it, you realize God didn't need to do any of that, right? He, he could have teleported Jonah from the ship into the sea. From the surface of the sea, he could have teleported him down to the bottom of the sea. From the bottom of the sea, he could have teleported him up onto dry land. He could have done all of that through supernatural means. And he didn't. He accomplished what he wanted done through the sailors, through the sea, through the fish. And Jonah 
is aware of it. He sees it. Very aware that what's happening to him is not accidental. It's not purposeless. Instead, he sees that there is divine activity behind it all. He sees it and he acknowledges it for what it is. It's the work of God to accomplish God's purposes in his life. When you're spiritually asleep, you have to recognize God's involved. He is working in your life to do something. Now, what is it that he's working to do? Let's think about how Jonah responds. He realizes, verse 4, that I am driven from your sight, which actually is what he wanted, right? He wanted to get away from God. He set out in chapter 1 to flee from the presence of the Lord. He no longer wanted to hear the word of the Lord. But Jonah didn't fully grasp what that meant. He didn't realize that it meant getting away from the source of life itself, away from the one who makes life meaningful. Jonah didn't understand that. And so what has God done? God has crafted a situation through the sailors, through the storm, through the sea, through the fish, to give Jonah what he wanted. See, picture what happens here in chapter 2. Jonah is thrown from the ship. Verse 3, he's sinking down through the waters. Verse 5, they start to close over top of him. He goes down, verse 6, to the roots of the mountain. He's lying there on the bottom of the seabed. He's got seaweed all tangled around his head. And God did all of that to bring Jonah to the point, verse 7, where he remembered the Lord and prayed to him. It's only when he hits rock bottom that Jonah reaches out to the Lord. Now, he summarized that for you in chapter, in chapter 2, verse 2. He tells you that if you want to understand what happened to him in the water, that, that here it is in a nutshell, verse 2, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. And you ask yourself, well, what was his distress? And he starts to unpack that through the rest of chapter 2. He was about to die, verse 6, there on the seafloor. That's when he remembered the Lord. That's when he prayed to God. That's the place where the fish found him and swallowed him to keep him from dying. That's when God answered him and rescued him from death. And Jonah describes that place as Sheol, as the belly of Sheol, the underworld. It's the place of the dead. It's the place of the people who are forever away from God's presence. In other words, God gave him a taste of what Jonah thought he wanted. He gave him a taste of what it was to be away from God's presence, a taste of what that place is that's utterly lifeless. And he discovers, verse 6, it's a place from which you cannot escape, that there are bars that close in over top of you forever. Verse 4, he's driven from God's sight to this place where God is not, banished from the presence of God in such a way that he cannot return. And it's when he finally experiences the result of what he wanted that Jonah now cries out to God. So what then were God's purposes in bringing him there to the bottom of the sea? It's to show Jonah that what he wanted is a horror beyond his imagining. To show him that sin, in any form, regardless of how good it looks, how enticing, how engaging, regardless of what it looks like, sin will always take you to a place where you do not want to go. And God helps him see that there on the bottom of the sea. But God also is showing him that having set himself on that course, he has no ability to save himself. He can't bring himself back. And so God has crafted everything in his world to get Jonah into a place that, where he gets a better picture of his true condition, a place that shows him his own ugliness and his desperate need of God's grace to save him. It's a place that get, gives him a sense of how much he really needs to be saved from. It's a place that starts to help him understand he needs to be saved from himself and from what he wants. And you can trust God to do the same thing for you. God will act through his world to bring you to a place that shows you your true nature, where he shows you the true nature of those things that have nothing to do with him, things that you want, but that things, if you actually have them, will damn you from his presence, things that will banish you so that you cannot return. 
God will show you your true need. Because if he doesn't, then you're going to stay stuck in some kind of religious world like Jonah used to live in. A world where you can hear God's word, where you can actually contribute to God's people just like Jonah did, but a world in which that religion does not actually impact your heart, doesn't change you. A world in which you don't think your need is all that big, and so you don't think it's that big a deal to disobey God. That you can choose to turn that on and turn that off whenever you feel like. And if God loves you, he will act through things in his world to put you in a place that brings you to the end of yourself. Do you know what that's like? I suspect a lot of you do. I suspect that a lot of us have had that kind of experience in our lives. For some of you, I suspect you're experiencing it right now. What's true of us Philadelphia suburbanites? We are fairly successful people. Some might call us overachievers. We tend to think they're just jealous. But we are people who are used to working hard. We're used to doing what we're told in order to succeed and then succeeding. We're used to that kind of a world. And then there is this wall that a lot of us have run into. This wall called COVID-19. This wall that has shut down normal life so that now all of the usual things that you have used to prop up your life in the past, all those things are now gone. And so there's nothing to distract you from life. You can't travel. You can't go to a game. You can't go to a play. You can't go to the movies. You can't go out to eat. You can't hang out with friends. You can do what? You can stay at home after most of you have been at home all day. And you can watch your screen and binge watch something after you've watched your screen all day. And most of us just can't stand that anymore. And so what is happening to people? A lot of people are depressed. A lot of people. People who are now dragging themselves through the day who just don't feel like doing anything. Or the opposite side, people are throwing themselves into work more than they ever did. There are no more boundaries between working and personal life. There's no more work-life balance. Or people are escaping through other addictions. Alcohol use is way up over these past several months. Other people are just anxious and worried. They're wondering, what's the next thing that's going to happen? And fault lines are showing up everywhere. In marriages, because spouses just can't get away from each other. In families, because parents and children can't get away from each other. Fault lines showing up at work. Fault lines that increase as the pressure of feeling like there's nothing that we can do keeps building up. And so people are what? They're checking out of life. And they're checking out of church. They say things like, I'll go back to CG. Or I'll teach Sunday school. Or I'll reach out to other people when things go back to normal. When that thing doesn't look so small. Or, or when it isn't so hard. And people are pushing pause. Not just on life but also on the kingdom of God, as if God was no longer advancing his kingdom, but as if God's just sort of waiting for life to go back to normal. In other words, right now, some of us are being brought to the end of ourselves. We're getting a chance to see that the way that we have organized life did not put God at the center as much as we thought we had. And I don't think that should be such a, a surprising Conclusions feels fairly obvious, right? If you only like life, if you only have joy and optimism about life, if you're only excited and interested in other people, if you're only invested in seeing the kingdom of God grow, when you can get up and go out whenever you want and do whatever you want, then what's obvious? It, 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 it's obvious that that joy and that optimism, that enthusiasm, that interest, those were not extensions that flowed out of your relationship with God. Because God hasn't gone anywhere. If those things are no longer part of your life, then you just have to acknowledge they were attached to something else, something that could be taken away. They weren't coming from this awareness, this bubbling up that I am the apple of God's eye and therefore all of these things are part of me all the time regardless of what I'm experiencing. If those things that used to define you are now gone, then the obvious answer is they were attached to something else. And it's times like these, hard times that take you to the end of yourself, that let you see that truth. 
the truth that you may have been trying to paper over with something else. When it's the case that you're not living in the presence of God like you need to, it is God's mercy to put you in a place that you cannot escape so that you come to the end of yourself. One of the most significant times like that for my wife, Sally, and I came five years into the start of our marriage. We've shared this story lots of times. We had slowly come to the realization those first few years of marriage that we liked the idea of being married a whole lot more than we actually liked the experience of it. And so for the first several years, we avoided that harder reality of marriage. For Sally, that meant spending lots of time with friends, since I wasn't all that friendly. For me, it meant losing myself in work. There's always work to lose yourself in. Work that I could justify as I just have to get this done so that I can take better care of us. We finished up where I was at seminary at the time, decided that we weren't really ready to go into ministry uh, and that I should pursue more graduate studies. We moved into an apartment in North Jersey where my sister and her husband used to live. Now, not many people know this, but in between East Brunswick and New Brunswick, there's a very small road. It's about a fifth of a mile long, and it sits between a super highway on one side and a 30-foot drop-off down to the Raritan River on the other side. This little road begins and ends on that super highway in between East Brunswick and New Brunswick. That's where our apartment was, in someone else's basement. We had one car, no money, and our first child came two months after we moved in. All while I started a new program and Sally stayed home with our daughter and suddenly there were no more distractions. We were hours from family, hours from friends. We had nowhere to go. We had no one to go there with if we had some place to go and no money to go anywhere anyway. And we finally had to face each other, finally had to deal with each other, even though most of the time that was not a pleasant experience for either of us. Friends drove up from Philly one time. This one guy says to me, you know, this place is kind of like a metaphor for your lives. It's in between. It's in between where you were and it's in between where you're going. God has put you in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere geographically and nowhere in your life. It's a lot, he said, like the Israelites wandering in the desert. What did he do? He saw our struggle, but he saw more than that. He saw the hand of God in our struggle. And I smiled, I agreed, nodded, and, and absolutely hated hearing him say that. But there was no way to argue. God had clearly put us there. His fingerprints were all over it, which meant that in time we had to admit his fingerprints were all over our lives. It was a really, really good time. Super, super hard, but really good. It took us another two years to finally hit bottom. We're incredibly stubborn. Seven years after we married, we got to closer, I hope, to the bottom. One of the most significant turning points for us that brought us to the end of ourselves showed us how much help we really needed. Expect God to do the same for you. In fact, maybe you want to look around because it may be that that's what he's doing right now for you. If you have no joy personally, if you have little interest in life, if you have little interest in others, if you have no optimism about life after Christ rose from the dead, if you have no enthusiasm, if you, know, if you have no investment in the kingdom of God, maybe it's time to ask, Lord, are you in this? Are you working through your world to expose where I've been living for something other than to be in your presence? If you've fallen asleep spiritually, first, look for God's hand in your life. Second, turn to God. The wake-up call from God is necessary, but the wake-up call is not sufficient to get you back on track with him. You do have to see where he's at work in your life, and you have to call out to him. You have to respond to him. Coming to the end of yourself, being at the bottom, that is not enough to change you. You have to reach out to the God who's put you at the bottom. You have to, verse 2, call out to the Lord. You have to, verse 2 again, cry out to him. You have to join Jonah in verse 7 when he says, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. You have to remember the Lord. You have to pray. You have to talk to him. You have to change direction. Instead of fleeing from the presence of God, instead of turning from him, 
looking for any and every distraction to keep you from having to deal with him. You have to stop and you have to turn and you have to start talking to him. That's what it means to remember him. Now here's the really amazing thing in this chapter. That's the only thing you have to do. That's all that you need to do to get started. Jonah says, verse two, that that was enough. God answered him. What's important is not the size or the amount of what you do. What's important is the direction. What's important is the intention behind what you do. This might be hard for some of us to wrap our minds around. Some of us are used to thinking that the result is really what's key, that the result of the effort that you put in is what's super important. And so we're not used to thinking about the starting point of that effort as being actually even more important. You're used to thinking about the result, not the intention. You're used to thinking about being successful, not about starting well, not about starting in the right direction. Think about it this way. Jesus was watching people contribute to the temple one time in Luke chapter 21, and he noticed a widow. She put in two very small coins into the offering box. And Jesus said she gave more than all of the people who were dumping bags of coins into the box. And he went on to explain that by saying they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. It's not the amount that you put in. It's not the size of the result. It's the intention behind it. It's the desire that counts. That's why when Jonah turns back to God, it's enough. It, it's, it's another one of these things that tells you just how radical God's grace really is. But meditate on this passage some more, and his grace is going to get even more radical than you've already realized. If the book of Jonah ended with chapter 2, or even if it extended into chapter 3, where Jonah obeyed God and preached to Nineveh, you might walk away from that, this and think, okay, th this is what? It's classic repentance, the classic Christian repentance. Jonah started in chapter one by disobeying God. God then disciplined him until he got Jonah's attention so that Jonah did what he repented, turned to God, and then obeyed. And you would say, okay, that, that, that sounds like a great success story, a great repentance success story. It would sound like how Americans typically think spirituality is supposed to work. You sin, you repent, you are forgiven, now it's all good, and you go on. Only there's chapter four in this book. Chapter four, where Jonah is angry at God for showing the same kind of grace to the Ninevites that God has just shown to him. In other words, Jonah really has turned to God. Kind of. His turning is real, but it's not really repentance. He's still hanging on to his hatred. So what gives? How do you understand this? Well, again, go back through chapter two and you'll discover that Jonah turns to God because of his distress. Verse two, that's the only reason. It's because of what he's suffering. He hated the results of his sin, but he didn't hate the sin itself. And so, yes, he does end up by obeying in chapter three, but not because he wants others to experience what he has experienced. He obeys because he has to because he knows if he doesn't, then he can expect more consequences. That's not repentance. That's resignation. He's resigned to what he has to do, not repentant over what he has been. Do you hear the tension in this book? Do you hear the lack of true spirituality in Jonah? How blind he is to what's really going on inside of him, even in the moment that he turns to God? Do you hear how that blindness affects what he defines as the real problem. That he sees his near-death experience as the real problem, not his hatred that God would give grace to people that Jonah does not think deserve it. Do you see how shallow his spiritual experience is? How he knows the right words to say, how he has the right categories to think in, but how little those words, how little those categories actually penetrate into his soul. They don't have much control over him. And so he can say, verse 8, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. He gets, really, honestly, genuinely, he gets that holding on to something other than God means that you don't get to be loved. It means that you doom your soul. 
but he doesn't see that he's still doing that. He can see other people's idols really well. His own, not so much. And you'll see that later in chapter four. And yet, God scoops him up off of the bottom of the seabed, carries him back to land. Chapter four, God keeps pursuing Jonah. He doesn't quit, he doesn't give up, so that he can bring Jonah to a place where Jonah has the chance to see what Jonah absolutely has to see. God enters into the complexity of a relationship with a very spiritually immature man. Why? Because that's what Jonah needs. And that means that God will do the same for you. Don't expect to work out all of your disagreements with God before you start a relationship with him. God doesn't expect that. God doesn't require that. That doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. If God loves you, then just like Jonah, he will do literally whatever it takes to bring you to your senses, even if that means taking you to the bottom of the sea. He'll do that because that's what love does. So you have to realize it's not the quality of Jonah's repentance that saves him. It's the quality of God's love for this partially repentant man. Jonah is saved because God's steadfast love is enough. So he talks about there in verse eight, steadfast love. It's that special Hebrew word hesed again. We've talked about this before. It means God's never ending, faithful, covenant keeping love for his people. And it's this love that moves God to be incredibly patient with Jonah. It's this love that listens to Jonah when he cries out. That ought to amaze you. This love that hears the word of the man who did not want to hear the word of the Lord. And it's this love that will deliver Jonah, delivers him from a watery grave in chapter two, continues to attempt to deliver him from a stony heart in chapter four. That's what Jonah is relying on when he remembers God, when he turns back to him and when he prays toward the holy temple. And you think, why, why the temple? Why is the, that significant? Because it was there that God's saving presence was. In the temple, you would find the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a box and it held the law that God gave to Israel and said, we are now gonna have a relationship. I will love you, here is how you will love me. You must obey this for us to have a friendship. Which would make you think then no relationship's possible, not with Israel, certainly not with Jonah. And so you would not think that Jonah would be able to look at the temple and think, God will keep loving me despite everything that I've done to break his law. So then there must be something else in the temple that would make him think that. The ark is there, the law of God is there. And something else is too. Something called the mercy seat. Mercy seat was a slab of gold that rested over top of the ark. It was a mercy seat that covered the law. And it was over top of this mercy seat that God told Moses in Exodus chapter 20, there I will meet you. There I will meet you over the commandments that you will break, and I will meet you without breaking you. Why is that? Because blood was sprinkled on this mercy seat. Every year on the Day of Atonement, blood was sprinkled from the goat that God accepted as a substitute sacrifice for the people. That blood, that mercy seat, that was what God, let God keep loving his rebellious people. That was what let him keep disciplining them when they broke his laws, taking them to the ends of themselves without destroying them. And that love was what let him rescue Jonah. That turned Jonah, what should have been a death, into a resurrection. A movement from the bottom of the sea back onto dry land. It was God's steadfast love that turned the belly of the fish into a vehicle that gave Jonah life. God took this thing, this fish belly, that should have been Jonah's final resting place. That was the thing that should not only have ended Jonah's life, but it should have digested him until he didn't exist. God took that thing and transformed it from a tomb to a womb. Not something that houses a lifeless body, something that gives Jonah new life. Jonah leaves that belly reborn. That's why Jesus said that Jonah was a sign that pointed to him, that he also would be raised from the dead. 
that he also would enter a tomb, but not permanently, that he would descend into hell, Sheol, but not stay there, that after three days and nights he would rise from the dead, that he would travel from God's presence to Sheol, but then back into God's presence again, and that he would do this for his people, because the blood of bulls and goats could never purify the people, could never atone for their sins, could never purify them from the many times that they broke God's law. But Jesus' blood could. And so because there was no other way for God to love his people who break his law, Jesus died for his people. Jesus entered the heavenly temple, the throne room of God, to purify his people with his own blood so that God could continue loving them and disciplining them without destroying them. That's the love that was coming, a love that was not yet there in Jonah's lifetime, but a love that the earthly temple pointed to. And just a glimpse of that love was enough to give Jonah confidence that if he cried out to the God whose presence was there, that God would hear him and respond to him. So if you've fallen asleep spiritually, look for God's hand in your life. Secondly, turn to him and trust his unfailing love. And then thirdly, very briefly, respond to him. Jonah does not know the depths of his issues. God's going to need to continue to pursue him. This life of faith is very complex, but it's very real. You see that reality when it's there. So verse 9, Jonah declares, I, with a voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. When faith is genuine, when you've seen the depths of your need, when you've seen the greatness of what God is sacrificing, you will have a voice of thanksgiving. You'll be thankful. Read that chapter again, and you'll discover that Jonah does not complain once. Not even about being in the slimy gut of the fish for three days and nights. He knows he deserves death. He knows that he deserves to be away from the presence of God forever. He knows that he's not getting what he deserves, and he knows that being rescued is pure grace. That verse 4, he will see the temple again because of God's steadfast love. That's what captures him. And you know it captures him because it comes out of his mouth. He's thankful. When you also experience real faith, when you experience the steadfast love of God, you also will be thankful regardless of whatever else you're going through. You'll be thankful like Jonah. And secondly, you'll worship like Jonah. He declares that he will sacrifice and keep his vows. Exact same things that the sailors did at the end of chapter one. He understands now that giving yourself to idolatry is foolish. It's vain, it's empty. It means that you give up steadfast love. And so Jonah says, I don't want anything to do with that. It's to the Lord that I will turn, I will worship. He thankfully worships and he has a declaration. He says, salvation belongs to the Lord. He has found life where he should only have expected death and Jonah now can't help declaring, I've been saved. And you will too. When you experience God rescuing you, you'll recognize that everything else that you tried to build your life on, everything else is just a cheat. All the idols that are out there cheated you. They didn't make better sense out of life. They didn't fill you with joy that survived and that could last. They weren't able to help you deal with the challenges of life. Why would you cling to them? They couldn't help you before, but God offers to help you now, even when you're half-hearted and when you don't know it. Turn to this God of unfailing love when he brings you to the end of yourself. Cry out to him for help, and he will rescue you from yourself despite you putting yourself there. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood, who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise, he can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. Lord Jesus, your love will never be forgotten. Lord, it is vast beyond any ocean we've ever experienced. It is beyond the depths of the universe, and it will last into eternity because it's part of you. It is something that started outside eternity that you have brought into time and you have made us the recipients of it. Lord God, teach us to trust you, to trust your love, to turn to you. 
to ask you, Lord God, fill us with joy, even though we've looked for happiness in so many other places. Lord, will you do that, please, in Jesus' name, amen.
And now please receive the benediction from your God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go in the grace, the love, and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ.